Okay, hello. Uh, welcome to the QRME uh, Grand Rounds uh, Education Series for Rural and Remote General Practice. Um, tonight we're looking at uh, paediatric presentations and particularly uh, looking at uh, behavioural presentations and in particular um, ADHD. So we'll get into it now. I'd like to um, welcome our case presenter tonight on ADHD, which is Dr. Fedosi Akhtar. Uh, Fedosi is a GP registrar with QRME and she's working at the Seven Day Medical Medic Practice Center. Medical Centre in Toowoomba. Um, we have Dr Jim McConaughey on the expert panel here tonight. Jim is a, uh, is a GP um, here in Toowoomba at, at the Seven Day Medical Practice. We have uh, Dr Mark Painter who's a, a paediatric specialist working at um, Toowoomba based hospital. Next to Mark, we have uh, Jesse Apter. Jesse is a um, dietitian working here in uh, Toowoomba as well. And next to Jesse, we have Dr. Pamela Seaton. Um, and Dr. Pamela Seaton is a psychologist who works here in Toowoomba. So if you could put your hands together and welcome them today. <laughs> and Fedosi will kick off with her uh, ADHD case. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Fidusi. Uh, I'm working with Tomba Seven Day Medical Center. So could, today I'm going to present a case of uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Uh, this is a case of my uh, colleague and supervisor, Dr. Jim McConkis. So I'm going to present uh, his patient's case. So this is about uh, RB, uh, who was born uh, on 28th of May, 2003. According to the antenatal history, the pregnancy was complicated with uh, gestational diabetes, which was managed successfully with diet. Uh, the delivery was full term. Uh, there was meconium stained, and uh, uh, he was in uh, special care nursery for 24 hours. So he was breastfed for one month. Um, uh, breastfeeding was uh, seized because mother thought uh, it was drying up and was uncertain about how much actually he was getting. <coughs> So according to parents' history, so mother was at her um, early 80, early, sorry, early 20s. So she left, left home at the age of 17. She completed high school. Uh, there was poor relationship with her extended family in Wide Bay. So the, she had some difficulties at school, um, uh, probably some form of dyslexia there. She works as an admins officer. She achieved bl uh, black belt uh, in martial art and she has some tendency of somatization. There is no significant other psychiatric history. So father uh, was uh, four years older than mother, and um, she, he uh, also has some uh, problem at school uh, regarding performance, probably suffering from some form of dyslexia. He, uh, uh, he finished his apprenticeship with the building industry, and he also achieved black belt in martial arts. So he uh, is a hard worker now working in uh, mine, fly in and fly out. He has extended family in Sunshine Coast. He rarely seen by GP and if comes, it's mostly with the after our GP for, but with different doctors. So this is RB uh, who has seen um, in our consultations uh, at his second and fourth month of immunization for standard immunizations. Mom returned back to the work um, to work at, sick, uh, at second month leaving RB in daycare. And uh, the family lived in a uh, peripheral town about 30 minutes away from Toowoomba. So he presented several times, so to about 29 presentations other than immunization over the next four years. Most of the time it is by after hours with multiple doctors uh, for upper respiratory tract infection, vomiting, diarrhea, and all sort of stuff. Only the immunizations that uh, were held uh, in our consultations. So, and uh, they need to, they, uh, there was the, the letters were needed to remind the parents for immunization. So in May 2007, he had his uh, four-year-old vaccination. So after his four-year-old vaccination, he presented with uh, vomiting with uh, recurrent nocturnal temps. He actually presented uh, for the third time over the three consecutive days uh, with uh, symptoms of vomiting and 
t temperature. Mother was worn out and anxious, and um, this pre these similar symptoms had happened six months uh, ago. So she was urging for a referral to a pediatrician to be reviewed for these symptoms, and he, she, uh, the RB was referred to pediatrician. <coughs> The pediatrician um, uh, sent us a letter back, and he was uh, uh, concerned about uh, Arby's behavior. So the letter uh, stating that uh, although uh, uh, Arby was referred for some vomiting and nocturnal cramps, but uh, the real problem is that Arby has very repetitive, annoying, attention-seeking behavior. He intentionally does acts he has been asked not to do so, this is actually a sign of, uh, usually a sign of maternal deprivation because he was in long-term daycare since his second month of age with the same supervisor and it should have settled now. And um, uh, so there is some possibility that there is delay in maturation and uh, further investigation are needed. And for uh, his sleeping difficulties to trial some uh, melatonin. After that family moved to more distant town in uh, 2007, uh, they keep seeing pediatrician and doctors elsewhere until mid-2009 when they moved close to Toomba again. So he was seen uh, about six times since 2010, um, uh, instigated uh, by GP most of the time for follow-up. So, but there was, there were multiple uh, frequent uh, telephone requests for scripts and referrals. So in 2012, family moved into Toomba. After six months, there was a family disharmony and um, trial of separation. Uh, mother was referred uh, to a psychologist, um, and um, uh, there were some inconsistent presentations. So GP requested mother uh, for ev every three monthly presentation, and each time the child should be with mother too. So since 2007 until 2010, the investigations has been done so far. EEG uh, showing mild uh, frontal lobe dysfunction, no epilepsy. So he has his hearing assessment, audiometry, that's normal. Uh, MRI also so far normal. His blood investigation, including the full blood count, LFT, thyroid function test, and iron, everything was normal. He had a uh, we score um, at the age of eight, six, and it shows borderline uh, his uh, verbal IQ and uh, perceptional uh, reasoning index all are borderline, but his um, uh, uh, full-scale IQ is low average. And um, so the pediatrician, in 2010, pediatrician referred uh, to uh, a pediatric neurologist for a second opinion for his diagnosis. And, um, and after that, uh, parents requested GP to change the pediatrician. And then, um, uh, ref, uh, he's, he's, since then, until now, he is seeing the uh, same pediatrician. So referral has been made to speech pathologist under uh, a care plan and also a mental health care plan done, and he's, he's, he has seen by child psychologist. So he started his preschool in 2008. And he changed at least four different schools over this, over this period. So diagnosis started with the possible maternal deprivation and then progressed to uh, possible autism, autistic spectrum disorder, anxiety, hyperactivity, speech delay, pervasive developmental disorder, cognitive impairment, and um, uh, probably, AD, probably ADHD. His current diagnosis uh, are ADHD, pervasive developmental <laughs> disorder, not otherwise specified, some cognitive impairment, and speech language impairment. His current managements are CONSATA and melatonin. So medication trials so far, melatonin, epilim, uh, statera, and ritalin. So this is his uh, younger sibling, um, three year old, three year younger than him. Um, um, he also has a, a similar behavioral problem, but his case uh, has been diagnosed pretty quickly, straightforward, and um, he's in now grade one. His uh, his differential diagnosis are like autis aut aut autism. Uh, autism spectrum disorder, ADHD, oppositional behavioral and obsessional behavioral and anxiety. 
He's current, he's on uh, Ritalin, Clonidine, and Melatonin. So there are two different cases. The reason of uh, presentation of both cases um, are uh, because of the first, the younger brother, the diagnosis took at least few times to get into the diagnosis of ADHD. But his younger brother, it, um, his diagnosis was pretty quick. And he, uh, he was referred by GP to the pediatrician for confirmation of the diagnosis. But in case of the, uh, the uh, younger, uh, so the older brother, it took time to come into the diagnosis. And he needed a lot of investigation before the main diagnosis come. So that was the case of um, um, RB. So uh, now the discussion is about like, um, uh, I would leave it for the panel to discuss what would be the typical aspect and atypical aspect of those presentations. and. Um, how can we make a diagnosis of ADHD? Okay, <coughs> thank you, Fadasi. Put your hand together for Fadasi. For... <laughs> okay, so do you have some questions you'd like to start off with? So uh, there are two different cases I present. Um, uh, that's two brother. So the first uh, one took, place, took time to get into the diagnosis, and there are a lot of medications has been has been tried. Uh, and um, uh, there are some typical and atypical um, uh, stuff uh, with each cases. So what do you think about that? My concern with the first boy was it was atypical in that uh, he, although he was coming to our clinic, he had 25 presentations over his first four years, never seeing the same doctor twice, you know, always mm -hmm. after hours. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, were we just all slack? the whole 25 of us or, or was there a problem with the mother opening up about what she considered abnormal in her son uh, and yet she sees a paediatrician for the first visit and it reminds me of being an intern, my history was never as good as my registrars. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, that's a, not a typical presentation of ADHD I wouldn't think but I would love to hear the experience of other people. Um, and then it took us really three or four years to get a diagnosis. We had one situation where Asperger's syndrome was considered or a pervasive de developmental disorder and then it was excluded totally for six months. We have letters saying no he definitely hasn't and then again in the final situation we do have it. Um, and I found that very confusing till I read about ADHD and, and the fact that sometimes 50% of them are associated with other psychiatric disorders and psychiatric dis, uh, diagnoses but for me these were two totally different presentations and the second one was far easier. The management of both is still just as difficult mm -hmm. but the diagnosis initially was so difficult with the older sibling. Is that a problem? Yeah, I, I, I agree with you completely there for those of you which is a good presentation. I think the um, the problems are, is that you've got a child that presents multiple times to a GP, you, you, you've got diarrhea vomiting, you've got skin rashes, mm. and that's what's presented to you. And, and so you don't have the luxury often of, um, of, of uh, having the issues brought to your attention. So it does take a bit of sleuthing around. And the difficulties as well is that we, um, we've got all these labels that we, you know, uh, of diagnoses and to try to fit them neatly into a label takes a huge amount of effort and time. I don't know about you, Pamela, but um, when I end up doing an assessment on these sort of children, you need at least an hour just for the initial consult, even if you've got some background information as well. And then it's often you come back again the second time, so it does take a lot of sleuthing and a lot of time to get, uh, to get a behavior profile. That's right. Um, when, when I'm doing an, an assessment of this sort of case, um, I usually have two one-hour sessions. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also gather a lot of collateral information from the schools, um, uh, um, wider family if I can. Um, so, you know, it's collecting a lot of data, basically. Mm -hmm. This case one's presentation is very complex. Yeah. Um, it's not, it would not be an easy one to differentiate. And even trying to sometimes, in some cases, differentiating between ADHD and um, autism, autism spectrum disorder very is very difficult um, because there's such an overlap um, mm. with uh, common features, if you like. Um, 
so yeah it does take a lot of history mm. and observation sometimes even if you know if I'm not sure um, I do a behavioral analysis as well at school and at home to um, to just get as much information as we can yeah and they and you know they can and they do coexist quite often and yes. we speak about the comorbidities of ADHD mm. and you know mm. you said 50% it's some somewhere of that order mm. um, you know most of these children when they present they've got a lot of um, features of oppositional defiance mm -hmm. and some of them have got conduct disorder already you know um, mm. uh, and um, mood mm. disturbances anxiety mm. and often the pervasive you know autistic yeah. spectrum disorder as well so Mm. Um, they are very tricky to tease out and it doesn't um, Even surprise me that you've got uh, mm. this mm. list of diagnoses that sort of changed and morphed one into the other because unless you've got the real time to do a complete full assessment early on, mm. um, we're going to make mistakes. Yeah. Even, even it, take, it took time for the pediatrician to confirm the Absolutely. diagnosis yes. for this, the first one. Yes. Mm. And I think also there's an usher, another issue here with the family dynamics. Yes. I think mm. there's a lot of information there that we need to get, a lot mm. of background mm. um, in terms of what is actually happening mm. in the family. Mm. You know, you've got, um, you've got uh, marital s separation, mm. you, you've got two parents with possible learning disorders, dyslexia, you know, possible yeah. dyslexia. Mm. There's a whole lot of issues there. Mm. Um, even the um, presentations after hours, I'll mm. be looking at all of sorts of issues so. of care. Mm. Um, and ability to care. You know, one of the things that struck me with this presentation is the um, looking at the the parents' resources. You know, we mm. may be able to come up with some wonderful intervention plans, but mm. looking at their actual resources, their cognitive resources, social resources, mm. in able to, being able to implement um, what we you know we're trying to help them with uh, is another issue that yeah really stood out for me. I mean, my, my reaction when I first got that letter back from the paediatrician, uh, knowing the history of the way they'd moved and mm -hmm. the after hours, uh, I, I just was so willing to accept his initial assessment of maternal deprivation. Yeah. Uh, it's so easy to just yeah. blame that, yes. blame the parenting, but obviously there's a mix of things. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes these kids drive even their parents so crazy they feel like depriving their their own children sometimes but it's hard to tell which comes first is, is it that important to do, to decide which comes first or is it more a matter of holistically treating the whole thing well it is yeah. it, it is a holistic thing but i think if you can understand what's um uh, what's actually happening and um the factors involved in this it gives you a better idea of what's what's maintaining some of the behavior so for instance if Obviously, the mother's um, having a really tough time, and any child with ADHD, and particularly if you have a child with ADHD and on the spectrum, and she's got two, mm -hmm. so um, you know she's she's really going to be um, stretched, incredibly stretched, um, and then if that can lead to um, learned behaviour as well in terms of the oppositional behaviour, the you know uh, inappropriate behaviour, yelling, all of this sort of thing. Um, maybe even hitting out, who knows, but that's what needs to be investigated. Um, so you, you're looking for not only uh, the possible development of what's happening for the child now to give you some ideas about um, what areas really need to be addressed in the intervention program, but also, um, you know, what's maintaining it. Um, this family needs a lot of support. Um, uh, to help them with their children and luckily there is a fair bit of support if here in Toowoomba um, mm. for children on the spectrum in particular there's not that much support for ADHD but uh, spectrum yes so we've had a question come out um, from one of our remote viewers um, who just to touch on that point then that there often there isn't a lot of resources out in rural and remote locations for for GP registrars um, and often it may involve a long 
uh, you know, a, lo a long travel or, you know, to get into a major centre for these sorts of things. Jesse, I'll just throw one question at you then that's come out is um, often in rural and remote locations, you know, um, there are people who are going to play around with diet or have suggestions around diet and often parents do come in and it's been my experience as well that, um, you know, after an assessment of a child, then they'll say, well, I don't want the drugs, I, mm. I don't want Ritalin, mm. I don't want these things. I'd rather do it with with diet. So, so what's your what's your been experience with that? And, and the rural question came in. What's your been experience with that sort of thing? Well, I don't know how what percentage of children I spoke to someone at RPAH today, and they don't either. <laughs> uh, with ADHD, where diet would actually be involved, but in terms of the total population, um, diet in terms of an el elimination type diet may involve about ten percent maximum of people. Um, with ADHD, it may be sm smaller than that. The, the key issues would be taking a thorough diet history, picking up on whether the parents had noticed any particular foods or situations where the child's behaviour may have been elevated. However, in a remote area, we would hope that they'd had access to an adequate diagnosis before we intervened and sometimes it's reassuring the parents and particularly where with some of those medications you're going to have problems with growth and appetite as well so tracking that the child's growing adequately um, I, we wouldn't assume that we would be the prime <laughs> And that Jim didn't refer to these no. as our prime source. The, the, these people will try anything <coughs> looking mm. for a single answer. Mm. And this family in particular, they've tried the fine gold diet, whatever that is, mm. I'm not sure what that is. Mm. They've tried uh, gluten-free diets uh, and they're recently on some new diet, which I'm not, I can't recall, but mm. they're so, they're so needing of something, they mm. will try almost anything. Mm. Uh, well, and I find that that's common. Mm. Mm. And it's often helpful to talk mm. to them about that and then mm. it can be either reassuring or there may be something that they have actually picked up that's relevant. At the moment, gluten, there's no evidence that that's involved with ADHD. Autism spectrum, there's some evidence. However, gluten gets very bad press. The other thing would be, um, which hasn't come up in this case, but making sure that celiac disease has been excluded because that can cause behavioural problems. And if somebody responded to gluten, well, professionally we wouldn't exclude gluten unless they had a, um, a gut check first to make sure that they didn't, or celiac disease wasn't exclu was excluded. You know, diet is a particularly... Um <coughs> interesting sort of aspect of this of the whole conversation that gets brought up in the in the consultation room because every every I mean most m parents that come in will tell you that their child becomes hyperactive if they have sugar or if they have coke or if they have coffee with their chocolate and those sort of things and you know too many parents have told me that for me to say you know you're talking rubbish because none of the studies unfortunately show that if you reduce these things out of their diet that they actually um, uh, improves their their symptomatology, if you want to put it that way. Um, however, there's a lot of studies that have shown that a, a sort of a healthy diet is has less incidence. You have less in, incidence of ADHD in people. Um, the study was done in, in West Australia, who are on a healthy diet as compared to an unhealthy Western diet with fast, fast foods, takeouts, uh, high fat, um, lots of uh, soft drinks and um, uh, chips and things like that. So um, there is definitely, I, I, I do think that there's something to go with it, but it's, you can't prescribe a diet, unfortunately, that's going to work in every case. Mm. I think I, t I tell the families, you know, if there's something that you know that if, if ketchup is making your child, you know, climb the walls, avoid it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but, um, you know, a lot of them, a lot of uh, families will be on fatty acid supplements, for example, and um, there may be some evidence that might be partially effective. There's some that are on the fine gold diet. I don't know that there's a lot of evidence for fine gold diet, which is a salicylate free diet. Um, Although that, the current um, fine gold diet's actually been updated and is more yeah. scientifically based, yes. which has made it 
a little bit easier to identify specific food groups or food chemical groups. <coughs> So. There was a there was a um, a real good study in, done in the Netherlands with um, with uh, a, f a, 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 a few Indian. foods diets, yeah. if you want to put it that way, where um, uh, behaviour did uh, get altered. But you know, you're speaking about a line, chicken and lamb, uh, rice and potatoes, um, bananas and apples, and and a couple of veg and a couple yeah. of veggies, and that's it yeah. for and five weeks or something, and, and then you start adding it. More effective with the autism spectrum uh, and they have a lot it, of I other behavioural yeah. issues as well in terms of mm. restriction. I, I too have noticed <coughs> clinically that um, parent, some parents who do try manipulating their diet um, have had some um, success in terms of behaviour um, but uh, you know there's still questions about particularly the autism spectrum where <laughs> what we're actually dealing with here. Um, so whether it is one or a, or a multiple of, you know, subgroups, there's a, still a whole lot of research going on. Um, and I don't think, um, you know, we can um, recommend a particular dietary change across the board. Um, I, I think, you know, yes, if, especially, as you said, for children, parents don't want to go straight into medication. That's what I find. And so they're, they're willing to try um, whatever they can. And then, yeah, if medication is needed. Um, and sometimes, you know, I, yeah, I just have to say to the parents, I think you really do need to talk to your paediatrician about medication um, because... Um, they do, sometimes they hang out too long for that, you know, and it's affecting the children. It's affecting their ability um, at school to learn. Um, so I, th I think there's no clean cut answer on that. I really do. I have seen some quite, to me, quite amazing responses to some things parents have done and then other times nothing. Uh, Stephen Smith, a GP registrar. Um, on that note about diet, and uh, also related previously to our previous talk, is ADHD and these kind of behavioural problems amongst children on the increase? Because I've asked, my parents are both quite elderly, and they said they, they can't recall any hyperactive kids in their class back in the 1930s. And is it we're just getting better at diagnosing it, or do you think it's more due to inadequate parenting because isn't ADHD much more prevalent amongst lower socioeconomic classes and uh, is it a diet related things and uh, are there any behavioural modifications like <laughs> disciplining the children for instance or uh, does that work? Well, I believe there was some issue in Western Australia where one paediatrician, I haven't been in Western Australia, <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, made the majority of the diagnoses and when that person retired there was a marked reduction in the number of people <laughs> diagnosed with ADHD and the um, uh, medications prescribed. Um, it doesn't really answer your question, I mean, <laughs> however. From my reading recently, Steve, it, in the US it's about 10% of the, of the population of children uh, have the potential for ADHD. Only half of them are medicated. Um, and it's about 9% in Australia, I think, or 7 to 9%. Um, it's about 2.5% worldwide. The question is, is it increasing or was it dealt with differently? Um, we're, in a, we're in a society now where rewards are plentiful, uh, punishments are few for children, we're, and they're the two things that modify behaviour, reward or punishment. Um, there are theories around that it was around back then, but the punishment system was far greater. Um, I don't know what the answers are, but there are probably other theories as well. Yeah, I mean, the studies in the States has shown that it is increasing in prevalence, you know, since the, probably the late 80s or early 90s, I think about 3% a year increase on, um, in prevalence. So it is increasing, whether it's because you're making more diagnoses or whether it is actually increasing or whether they're standing out more or 
you know, um, there's a lot of reasons uh, why that strikes that might me be as a, uh, a good point from um, like carrying on from last. It seems like it, uh, my niece is a school teacher, and uh, so I get an insight into the. the it's quite an unnatural environment to have children uh, sitting bolt upright, facing attention, and doing classwork and learning alphabets and whatnot when they're five, six, or seven. The natural sort of environment for the five or six year old is chasing around and climbing the walls pretty much mm. and are we asking too much of our five or six year olds are we saying hey you can't sit still for 10 minutes you should a five or six year old be sitting still for 10 minutes there is absolutely a, a developmental um, uh, progression and you know to diagnose a hyperactive two-year-old for example is really, really difficult and, and I try and avoid it at all costs because there is just such a developmental progression in their ability to sit still and, and do things a little bit more, co uh, more cooperatively. Um, I don't know that the school, I think the schools have become wilder since our day. You know, 50 years ago, um, we were sitting a lot stiller than a lot of the kids are nowadays. They get a lot more um, laissez-faire in their schools and I think that um, that might be allowing the kids that are naturally a bit hyperkinetic to uh, express themselves um, physically mm. in the school. But, um, you know, certainly there has been a, a huge increase in, um, in, uh, over in diagnoses and the reasons for that is obviously di um, difficult to know for sure. And what they touched on with the last group about what I would call chaotic eating and lack of restraint at meal times and access to food, children access food or choose what they're going to eat rather than have a standard meal mm. as the um, paediatrician mentioned. It's interesting that you bring up the question about the increase in prevalence of obesity in the last uh, discussion and the increase in incidence of ADHD and could they be actually related and that's, that's a really an interesting topic all in, a, in and of itself. Um, mm. And there is uh, some neurobiology that, that could support the link. I mean, we can maybe put it out to the audience here. You know, do you associate kids with ADHD being overweight, underweight, or no association? Anyone would say overweight? Hands? There's one or two there, three there. Underweight? Five or six? Um, no association? About three or four? It's been well established that it's associated with overweight. overweight. Mm. And especially in adults with ADHD, they tend to be overweight. And um, there's, there's questions about dopamine transport and things like that that might be related to that. Uh, Jim, just to sort of bring it back, because we did touch on a little while ago about the idea of this kind of diagnosis or making a diagnosis is, is almost virtually impossible in a 15-minute in a appointment. Um, and that's probably one of the things, just for, to, to bring it to like GP registrars, especially working in rural remote loc locations, a 15-minute appointment is going to be almost virtually impossible. Mm. Um, you'll only ever touch on it. And I guess that's when that longitudinal process comes into play being able to see someone you know on a number of occasions but I just wondered from your experience then now I don't know how long ago this case was for you but it's, it's a similar presentation what kind of key things to cover in that first sort of 15 minutes and maybe Mark as well is there is there a physical examination is there particular physical examination things I mean maybe except for obesity like you're touching on but other things that we kind of should be looking at in that first couple of appointments well I mean one of the things, this case was an atypical presentation. I never had, was totally unsuspicious of the possibility of that yeah. in this case. In those cases I am suspicious of, it's usually a parent or grandparent coming in and saying there's something wrong with this kid, you know. Um, and then it's usually a matter of uh, you just talk to the parent, let them vent, see, her, and then you keep your eyes on the kid. I mean, if they're sitting. Uh, I should say child, kids are a goat, I shouldn't say those sorts of things. But uh, yeah, but if the child's sitting quietly there and interacting with his brother and sister and they're normal and he relates with me correctly and normally, it's hard to make that decision in 15, 20 minutes. Mm. But you know, you, you, for me I have a working hypothesis, is this the parent or is it the child? Uh, and then I, I go from there and if I'm suspicious it's the child, there are a few organic things we need to exclude and you do that through history, you know, your birth history, possibility of head injuries, your hypothyroidisms. Uh, there's a list on one of the slides uh, somewhere there that of organic issues we have to exclude. Um, 
so it's there, there's the things there, you know, and you try and take those out of history. I usually have to pull out the book and make sure I exclude them if I'm really suspicious. And I guess it's, I mean, years ago when I was younger, I would just, if a parent said that to me, I would quickly just do a referral to a paediatrician and let them sort it out. I guess our colleagues now prefer us to do a bit of a workup. Um, so I try to exclude those sorts of things. I, and I'd like to hear from Mark what sort of investigations or they would like us to do before we refer them on. Um, but I try and get an idea of, of a working opinion. Yeah. And then if I'm fairly confident it's a behavioural thing or a parenting thing, I, I'm quite happy to say that to the parent. I, I'd say, I think this is the case in the hope that the paediatrician will, if they'll confirm that, they'll send them back to me because then the, the, the parent is going to have confidence in me that I really did know when I sent them away. D does that make sense? Mm. So should we be doing Fragile X mm. studies on every kid that comes in with a behavioural disturbance? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I think um, you know, quite often we, there's no, nothing that, no investigations required. Obviously you need to do a, a, a full, you know, full examination and, and look for dysmorphic features and you know I think if you've got a child who's got some autistic features that's that's all over the place and is intellectually impaired you know and he's a boy you might start thinking about fragile X um, but uh, you wouldn't be doing fragile X studies on, on, on every one of them I wouldn't be doing chromosomes on them all I wouldn't be doing lead levels unless you know maybe they're from some dark you know, Mount Isa or something where there's prevalence of that um, you know, the little ones, you and we might be starting to think about iron, iron, you know, iron levels, um, but you, there's, there's, there's very little in the way of... of you, know, you can often pick the hyperthyroid ch child clinically anyway, so I don't think that we need to do many investigations for the standard um, uh, common garden type of child with ADHD. Mm. I think Lu Lucy has a question. So thanks, guys. Um, I was just going to ask about um, managing these cases um, in the community and particularly in a rural community. Um, we've talked about um, some uh, role that diet may play in, in managing this and about medications. But I understand there's some behavioural modification programs that are available um, for managing ADHD. And my, my thought is just about commenting on in the rural area how we can get access to those programs for these children. Um, and even if you can comment too on about um, uptake of those programs. So, um, in my limited experience, I've found that parents are reluctant to engage, but when they do engage, they do find them quite useful. Um, things like the Triple P or the 123 Magic. But um, I recently was, was trying to refer someone to that in our local area and I wasn't sure quite where to go. Um, if you guys could just comment on that, thanks. Um, I'll just briefly comment, I think, before handing over to Pamela or to Jim. But, um, you know, I think that the uh, psychosocial management is, is, is important, um, be particularly because of all the comorbidities. You know, I think straight ADHD is possibly a little more simpler where there's no, but none of the disruptive behaviours. If they're just inattentive type of ADHD, quite often they're just lacking that ability to stay focused and, and medication really works well for those kids. Um, however, you know, um, uh, they all need some sort of um, psychosocial support or behaviour management plan, especially the ones that are disruptive. Um, I think you mentioned Triple P, which is a state-based program which we, we use where the parents are, um, are helped with sort of, uh, you know, uh, behaviour management. One to three magic is very similar. I particularly like that, that program. Uh, Education Queensland have MYCP as well, which they can, they can help out there. And then obviously there's the individual um, healthcare plan that, that you can refer to. Um, people like Pamela to deal with all of these difficult, mm. difficult uh, families. It's families that need the help. Mm. Um, I think um, behaviour management programs are really uh, important in terms of cases of ADHD. And um, I think the first thing is to help the parents understand what ADHD is, what the profile is, what it is for their particular child and help them um, to, um, uh, to devise a behaviour management plan for their child. Because remember this is, um, it's not a naughty child, okay? So there are things that we may expect of them that are unrealistic in terms of the person they are. They're, so um, we need to work around that. We need to find ways to accommodate some of the differences, to um, 
uh, to make compromises even sometimes, you know, and even in terms of um, like the Triple P program, um, sometimes you have to make, you have to adjust that for these children because straight Triple P is, you know, not going to work that well uh, for children with ADHD and autism spectrum disorders. You need to adjust it. And I think from my experience, the more parents understand how their child functions, the better able they are to manage that child. And, uh, and also that goes for the schools as well. The better teachers understand how their child functions, the less difficulty they have with behaviour. And so um, I think that's a vital part. And psychologists do a very good job at that. Yeah, that's what they're trained in. Mm. So in terms of um, regional and remote areas, um, there may not be particular programs available out there, but there are psychologists out there. Um, and even uh, in terms of if they're not, you know, uh, if they don't have a lot of experience in those areas, they can, um, they can arrange for supervision from psychologists who do have experience in that. And I know I do that for um, rural, um, remote areas as well. So, you know, because we, in my practice, we see people who actually come in from Gundawindi, from St George, from Moree, from all over the place um, because of that lack of service further out. But also, we're starting to use technology. You know, we use Skype. Yeah? And that's helpful. Um, you've been talking a lot about um, behavioural modification of the child and medicating the child and all those sorts of things. But I'm just wondering, what kind of place does doing sort of behavioural modification um, therapy with the parents as well, what sort of um, place does that have in the treatment of these kind of hyperactive children? Because if there's problems at home, obviously it's going to make the behavioural issues worse. Mm. So would doing that sort of thing with the parents, does that generally help with the behaviour of the child as well? Or is it just completely um, separate sort of thing? I think you've got to mop up the collateral damage and try to prevent it. Um, I mean, the two ADHD, just as a side, if they're ADHD alone without any collateral diagnoses, they're great. They get to teenagers, 15, 16, they start thinking about what they're going to do. They get that insight that, yeah, I am different to the other kids. They'll start taking their medication, mm -hmm. they really start and they'll work with their disease. They know that if they can only focus for 15 minutes, they'll focus for 15 minutes, then they'll go and kick a ball, then they'll come back. They're great. It's when you get all these other collateral things in with it, like the AS, autism, spectrum disorders, the aspersions, those pervasive de development, the oppositional defiance, the conduct disorders. I mean, anyone needs help to cope with those in someone. Um, that's like, you know, having a a room full of, or a day full of every patient being a personality disorder, you'd go home totally crazy at the end of the day. These parents live with it day in, day out. Mm. And they really do need help to cope with those diseases. And, and, um, and in this case, for example, a lot of their marital dysfunction was over the dysfunction within the home. So mm. some of their uh, marital counselling was how to help them cope with their children, mm. uh, how dad when he comes home from the mines can give mum a break, Different, just simple little things because um, they've got to live with them day in day out until those children are 20. And sometimes the parents mm. they need um, uh, their own individual um, mental health care plans. <laughs> I have a lot of clients like that. Um, for anxiety, stress, I mean to the point you know where the, the Helping Children with Autism program, that's incorporated into that. Um, so there's funding for those children under seven um, for their parents to receive that sort of support. Um, you know, um, arranging um, respite for them or putting them in contact with where they, they can organise respite. That's really important. It really is a family issue. Whenever, I think, whenever I'm working with children, 
it's not about the one child, it's the whole family. There was, there was recently an article published, I think a week or two ago, that I saw. Um, I didn't read the whole article, but they discussed uh, treating the parents of children with ADHD with Ritalin if they were diagnosed with ADHD and they find the children do better. <laughs> so if the parent has got ADHD, and I think this is something that, that, that the, G, you know, the GPs can really make a difference, is that if they can start picking up those sort of issues in the parents, they can often help them, I think, and uh, probably help the whole family dynamic. So it's not just necessarily the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the family care plans and things mm. for the parents, but also, if necessary, a medication. Mm. Um, so we're, we're running pretty low on time. I'll just, if, we'll have one last question here that, that's come in. Is just, Mark, with, um, with medication then, so we can touch on that, because unfortunately, often a lot of them do end up on medication. So, as a, as a registrar working out in, in fairly rural or remote practice or even regional or wherever really, what sort of things should we be looking at with a kid on these medications? Is this something that we need to do on a regular basis? I understand that maybe weight or appetite or those sorts of things. And is this something that, what, how long are kids usually on these medications for? So we can educate the parents around this as well? Right, I mean, yeah, we'll just briefly can touch on that. You know, children that's on, that on stimulants, which is really just the um, methylphenidate, uh, Ritalin, and the um, dexamphetamine, um, either the short or the long-acting uh, methylphenidate, um, the issues relate mostly to uh, uh, appetite, appetite suppression, uh, sleeping disturbance, mm -hmm. and irritability, and sometimes depression as well. So that afternoon irritability is a huge problem for a lot of the families to deal with. So, I mean, we, and it, it can, uh, you know, push up the pulse and blood pressure like any stimulant can do and bring out arrhythmia. So I, we always check for, for uh, underlying arrhythmias or cardiac problems on them. But if you follow in one up in, say, Chinchilla or in, in, in Moree or something that with a, a child that's been seen, and we might only want to see them every year just to touch bases, I think we need to make sure that they're growing well so that they're not losing weight, that they're actually gaining weight, gaining height, so that we check their growth check their blood pressure, and then just do a general physical so that they, you know, you know, they're not depressed and, uh, and irritable and crying and, 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 mm -hmm. and having those sort of side effects that can be associated with the stimulants. Yep. Excellent. All right. Well, um, unfortunately, we're going to have to leave that one there. Um, I'm sure, again, there's, there's a lot more that we could, we could talk about on this issue. Um, so if you could put your hands together and thank um, Ferdosi and the panel for their presentation tonight. Thank you.